As Nikita Grushev gripped the last banana in Eastern Europe, he uttered a sentence to the surrounding Winyans that would ripple through the annals of history. When we take letters like I and replace them with the word we, even illness becomes wellness. In an ironic turn of events, the Minions, who had twice invaded Russia and failed spectacularly, would end up joining the communist world superpower that was the USSR. But how exactly would these events come to we? As the Eastern Front collapsed towards the end of World War II, many of the veteran minions of the disastrous Stalingrad campaign found themselves once again in retreat in Russia. Low morale and an unwillingness for prolonged suffering at the hands of the rapidly advancing Red Army forced the minions to start surrendering en masse. When Hitler did the unthinkable following his rap battle defeat at the hands of the famous Marshal Eminem, Many of the minions now recognize Joseph Stalin as the most despicable living person on the planet, and many began swearing their allegiances to him. Rather than prosecute the minions for war crimes, Stalin absorbed them into the Soviet machine, recognizing that he would need them in the coming conflicts with the West over differing political ideologies, mainly regarding the manufacturing of Twix bars. But for Stalin, turning the minions into a Soviet weapon would be much harder than he thought. Years of imperialist and fascist mindsets had made adopting communism extremely hard for the very individualistic minions. To fix this, Stalin ordered the minions to be sent to the Grulags, which were political labor camps designed by Stalin's right-hand subordinate, Nikita Robert Grushev. Realizing that in order to make the minions a true communist weapon, loyal to him and him alone, Grushev would need to first break the minions. He did this by forcing impossibly hard labor upon the minions, then systematically gaslighting them into thinking that they are the reason that communism has been a failure. Eventually, this created a toxic relationship between Grushev and the minions, where the minions now depended on Gru for any form of emotional validation, and therefore had absolute loyalty to the rising Red Star. As the minions accepted communism in the early 50s, Grushev changed their name officially to the Winions, which stripped the minions of the last remaining form of individuality. When Stalin passed away in 1953 after a fried chicken induced stroke, it would be Grushev and his loyal Winions that would seize the levers of state Soviet power. As Grushev connived his way to the premiership, he began denouncing all of Stalin's left Twix's policies and the Man of Steel's desires for superior Siberian style fried chicken. This backpedaling of Stalin's policies by the Kremlin began a period of de-Stalinization, and it was infamously characterized by Grushev when he revealed Stalin's fried chicken formula during a closed-door event, known as the Secret Speech. Instead of outcompeting the Americans in the areas of fattening foods, Grushev shifted Soviet policy onto one thing and one thing only. Proving communism was superior to capitalism by stealing the moon. To the Soviets, getting to space before the Americans was absolutely essential, as it was the one place that hadn't been corrupted by capitalism. But the Americans weren't just sitting idly by as Grushev and the Winyans seized power. Following World War II, the Americans began a covert operation of pardoning and recruiting thousands of the Third Reich scientists to fill important political and scientific positions back in the United States. Their space program was filled with infamous names from the war that included Jimmy Neutron, Dr. Nefario, Dr. Heisenberg, and even Heinz Doofenshmirtz. Furthermore, US President Harry Truman foresaw the growing threat of the Winyans and decided to alter US foreign policy in order to combat it. In Season 3, Episode 5 of The Truman Show, 
Truman announced that the US would do everything in their power to keep the world healthy by containing the spread of communism in a medical policy he appropriately named the Truman Doctor Inn. This policy goal, however, was mainly a front so that the CIA could stage the 1954 Guatemalan coup in order to protect the profits of the United Fruit Company. But it wasn't really about protecting the profits so much as it was about cutting off the supply of bananas to the USSR, which the Americans hoped would cause a Winyans revolt. This brilliant but tragic political coup by the US may have even caused the doctor's plot against Stalin at the end of his life, as the cutoff of fruit exports to the Soviet Union meant that Stalin had no apples to use to keep his Soviet doctors away. Forcing the Winyans to eat nothing but potatoes, Khrushchev was able to avoid a revolt and began pushing the Winyans hard to begin his initial plans for claiming space as a communist asset. In 1957, the Soviets beat the Americans to space by launching the Sputnik satellite into low Earth orbit. Khrushchev would then make it a 2-0 lead in 1961 by launching the first living thing into space when he launched Benny Gagarin into orbit, who was born in the Soviet sector of the occupied Lego city. Khrushchev needed Benny to go to space, not because he wanted to prove that the Soviets were superior technologically, but because he wanted Benny to confirm that the moon was indeed real. Realizing that the US was being thoroughly beaten by the Soviets, JFK challenged the USSR to a double or nothing winner-takes-all race to the moon in a key speech he delivered in 1962. Thinking he could skunk the US and go up 4-0 in the Space Jam series, Khrushchev accepted Kennedy's offer. But Khrushchev didn't want to just beat the Americans to landing on the moon. He wanted to steal the moon before they could land on it and force the Americans to fake the moon landing so that the Soviet government could catch the US in a big lie. As Khrushchev made the preparations for his next space expedition, he had a huge problem on his hands. The Winyans were fed up with the depletion of bananas being fed to them and decided to go on strike. Without the Winyans, Khrushchev's space program was essentially dead in the water. He had no choice now but to attack the banana republics and gain access to their precious banana fields. Khrushchev planned to re-establish his banana supply lines for the Winyans by moving nuclear weapons to the friendly communist island nation of Cuba. From there, his nuclear weapons would be in range of hitting Guatemala. Unfortunately, the US completely misunderstood this aggressive action as being a direct threat to the US mainland and had a tense standoff with the Soviet boats transporting the nuclear weapons to Cuba in an event that almost caused humanity to be wiped out by nuclear war. Unfortunately for Khrushchev, this Cuban missile crisis would be his undoing. The threat of nuclear Armageddon was bad for the communist mob and in 1964, Khrushchev and the Winyans were ousted from power by Polly and Ed Brezhnev and the Sopranov crime family. Sometime in the early to mid 60s, Khrushchev fathered two sons by the names of Felonius and Drew. As he was ousted from the Soviet premiership, Khrushchev became worried that he and his family would be whacked by the Sopranovs, just as Stalin had done to Trotsky all those years ago. To prevent his twin sons from being sent for by the Sopranovs, or worse, having them be located by Lord Vader and turned to the dark side, Khrushchev decided to split up his family. While remaining in the Soviet Union with his son Drew, he sent his other son Felonius and his wife to the one place that could never be touched by the far-reaching hands of communism, San Francisco, California in order to keep the Winyans from falling into the hands of the Sopranovs. Khrushchev sent them to the Americas as well, where they would remain loyal to his son, Felonius Grew. Although Khrushchev was never whacked by Brezhnev during his forced retirement from power, Khrushchev was successful in spreading small forms of favorable propaganda of his reign, such as the rumor that the moon doesn't even exist and it's just a large projection that is turned on every night by the Americans. 
In this version of the story, Grushev never lost the space race and remains a Soviet hero. A shout out to my patrons for your continued support of this channel.